Um, the whole red concept was first mooted in, in 2005 in the, in the COP11 in Montreal. Um, we focused mostly on the issues of di direct deforestation. The second D, relating to degradation, uh, was added later on at further for COP negotiations. And then we moved into the world of red plus and red double plus. Um, and I'll just quickly outline these, uh, the latter two in particular. Red plus is the idea of including uh, m much more wider uh, co-benefits. Um, and red double plus um, includes land conversion of a much wider uh, spectrum. But crucially, uh, red, REDD and REDD plus are essentially dependent on the definition of forests. Uh, and this is something we can go into, uh, I'm sure, later this week. And I think uh, Ian mentioned this uh, very articulately yesterday. Uh, but REDD double plus, which ICRAF and other organizations are working on, um, are ultimately looking at uh, issues of land conversion, but which do not depend on the definition of forest. But for us, related to great apes, we're primarily focused on, on red plus. <laughs> So in terms of opportunities for red in Africa, um, essentially Red Plus seeks to reverse the dr drivers of forest conversion by rewards. Um, the same concepts of payments for environmental services, and this is, these rewards can, can accrue at the national, sub-national, community or individual level. Um, in terms of high forest and carbon sequestration, there's over 600, 600 million hectares of forest available in the, in the Congo Basin, which are subject to uh, potential deforestation and degradation. Uh, this represents 16% of the world's total, and thus the Congo Basin harvests, har harbors an enormous, large, an enormous block of forest, uh, second only to uh, to the Amazon basin. And hence, the CBD described potential uh, for Red Plus and biodiversity syn synergies as immense. So, Red Plus is a new hope for conservation. C4 has done an enormous amount of work, and perhaps uh, has put. A, uh, rather too much emphasis on, on red um, as a potential for, for forest conservation. Um, but there is strong evidence to suggest that Red Plus could provide a, a significant net benefit for conservation. But as long as the mechanisms of red are able to compete with the drivers of deforestation, and this is fundamentally key. So in theory, uh, the co-benefits of Red Plus, so we refer to them as co-benefits, which include linkages between poverty, poverty alleviation, uh, an issue we're particularly concerned about uh, in this meeting, biodiversity conservation, and especially improved forest governance, and I'll touch on this a little bit later on. But the efficiency of Red Plus is ultimately going to be um, defined by the details of the design at both the global level, but implementation at the national and project scales. So what are the, the scope for Red Plus to contribute to great ape conservation? So there's strong evidence to suggest that higher biodiverse forests sequester the most carbon. Simon Lewis's work uh, in Central Africa, to which many of us at C4 contributed, um, has found that um, old, old growth forests in Africa um, are able to sequester much more carbon than we actually thought. And these um, forest systems generate revenues and alternative land uses um, if um, they are essentially the economic incentives are competitive. And as such, red projects could be located in, particularly in biodiversity rich areas, where keystone species such as great apes uh, occur. And just to emphasize this, both the UN Red uh, program and the December, last December's joint declaration on the intent of red in the Congo Basin highlight great apes on their cover. So it's, I don't think there's any coincidence there that there are strong linkages between great ape conservation and red plus. But ultimately, the design of Red Plus has to be embedded in the past. And this is a very nice editorial in The Guardian from 2009. And they highlight that Red could provide enormous opportunities for forest conservation, but as long as we learn from past mistakes and experiences. And we're particularly looking at payments for environmental services. Um, as a concept, PES has been extremely um, well promoted, particularly in Latin America and Southeast Asia. But many of the schemes remain somewhat incipient because of the, the, the design aspects. And of course, integrated conservation develop, development projects, uh, which often focus on great ape conservation, have a long and checkered history, uh, which also inform uh, potential Red Plus design. Obviously, Red, Red Plus will require collaboration between multiple government agencies, and this is often not uh, an easy thing to do, as we all know. 
um, but also meaningful stakeholder participation and engagement at all levels, from the regional to the national to the local to the community, is absolutely <coughs> critical. And understanding the trade-offs and benefits. I mean, who's going to benefit and who ultimately uh, negotiates for trade-offs within particular landscapes where great apes occur. And one of the things that, that has come up recently is, uh, particularly in Africa, is the lack of capacity, the lack of understanding in, in how to implement pilot red projects um, and what do we do about that. So we've, we've done a, um, a fairly extensive review of looking at integrated conservation development projects and how red can be influenced by best practice and lessons learned from, from such practice. And I can circulate this paper if, if anybody's particularly interested. The key actors for Red Plus in Africa um, are the usual, the usual folks, um, UN Red, the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership, uh, CBFP, and I've got them in there twice, the African Forest Forum, Forum Comifac, Comesa, and CARPE. And in fact, the declaration on, on Red Plus and conservation that was signed last year was driven by Comifac. But the potential risks and challenges uh, for Red Plus, um, focusing on carbon alone, um, can be problematic in terms of potential leakage. As we all know, if you focus on one area that's going to be conserved, uh, another area ultimately uh, could suffer through, uh, through conversion. And we've seen some interesting examples of international leakage. The moratorium in Indonesia, which is uh, uh, prohibiting further expansion of, um, of oil palm, has led to Malaysian and Indonesian companies looking at alternative sources uh, of land for oil palm cultivation, and we've seen large concessions being established in Liberia in particular, and more recently uh, Cameroon. A disputed risk, I would say it's disputed, uh, is de dependent on the definition of forest employed. And this has been a whole subject of debate within uh, FAO, ICRAF, uh, and, uh, and other colleagues. And um, Ian mentioned yesterday that the uh, situation in Malaysia that, um, that plantations themselves can be classified as forests, but here in Indonesia there's been recent legislational change which indicate that oil palm could also be uh, classified as forest. So that's a rather problematic uh, situation. And another major problem uh, in most of the countries in Africa are overlapping tenure claims. We have customary tenure overridden by uh, state ownership of land, uh, and these often result in conflicts of land use. In terms of governance, this is a horrible map because I had to condense it from a, a, a larger uh, figure. But um, the colors in the map represent, the darker colors represent poorer governance. Uh, the lighter um, colors indicate in countries with much better governance. Um, there are some concerns that funds provided by Red Plus through the, the finance mechanisms can lead to increased decent, uh, centralization, given the fact that the majority of the forestry sector has become considerably more decentralized, will Red Plus result in increased centralization, increased corruption, and ultimately elite capture? Will the benefits be shared with those who are uh, supposed to be shared with? And will it be ultimately business as usual from the environmental perspective? Benefits from uh, environmental conversion often accrue to elites and national governments rather than uh, local people, which has a huge impact on rural livelihoods. And hence, there's a, an enormous need for the respect for rights and benefit share, sharing mechanisms. And the CBD are working on a very extensive uh, series of uh, social safeguards to ensure this, in theory, doesn't happen. Um, we published a book uh, with IUCN uh, in 2009. Um, and basically, the, the, there was a very nice chapter uh, focusing primarily on RED. Um, and highlighting the issues of, of potential human rights abuses uh, for Red Plus programs. Um, and ultimately, we have to uh, acknowledge that local people have a very important role to play in the design of any Red scheme. And there's been a whole bunch of um, uh, pushback, if you like, from indigenous peoples groups related to, to Red. And even the, the ecologist has highlighted the, the issues related to indigenous peoples and their potential uh, exclusion from, from red projects and the ultimate benefits that accrue from them. Um, and again, related to, particularly related to Africa, um, these same issues. And a number of groups are bringing up um, the issues of rights, access, and benefit sharing related to red. And these are particular concerns because the design of, of Red Plus in its incipient stages as it is, um, doesn't explicitly include 
um, inclusion of, of indigenous people's rights and benefit sharing. So ultimately a summary of the major constraints. Um, one of the problems is that, in, particularly in Africa, Red Plus is at various stages of development. Uh, pilot sites uh, have been selected, um, and yet the design and implementation of Red as a, as a global concept have yet to be resolved. So you have rather loose, if you like, uh, uh, implementation efforts uh, without the design uh, being uh, effectively in place. One interesting thing that I, I read recently was that the majority of the Red Pilot schemes are not being funded by climate change finance, and they're actually being funded by uh, the traditional overseas development assistance fu funding available for most countries, and that needs to shift because it, it ultimately uh, constrains uh, potential sustainability in terms of long-term Red commitments. Monitoring, reporting, and verification, these are extremely complex processes which require um, very, very uh, high capacity in terms of national states um, and it's something again that C4 are working on with a number of countries uh, to de uh, develop a, a series of framework and guidelines uh, looking at the best means of monitoring uh, Red Pro Plus projects particularly for conditionality and making sure that payments are being paid based on performance. I mentioned earlier the distribution of incentives where, who are the poor and what role are they going to play in potential Red Plus programs and the regulatory aspects, uh, national governments need to put in place the correct and, and appropriate incentives uh, for, uh, for Red Plus to make sure that they are effective both at the national but also local scales. Managing risk of government failure, I mentioned uh, the government uh, failures in terms of corruption and the corruption indices and are we potentially uh, precipitating a return back to recentralization of, of government. And in Indonesia, that's been a, a major uh, debate, debating point in, in uh, making sure that the decentralization process that occurred in the 1990s is not being compromised. And it, to re-emphasize this, this issue of multi-actor participation, it's not enough to consult uh, local people, but they actually have to receive consent. And the issue of free and prior and full consent for Red Plus uh, programs is, is critical to, to making sure that uh, the poorest of the poor who are involved and um, integrated into these Red Plus projects are, are, are fully on board, understand why they're on board, and ultimately benefit from the, 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 uh, the financial and potential other benefits that accrue to these particular projects. And uh, that's it, so thanks very much.